the, the title that of my talk, well, it's not up there, because I have no PowerPoints. Um, the title of my talk is, is that the sort of half right? I want to talk about long-term effects of, um, of, sexual, of sexual abuse as I, as I see it. Um, and also I'm going to talk about my experience of dealing with uh, my old football club uh, when it comes to um, the issue of trying to make some sort of difference in this area. So let me give you a bit of background on myself. I think that's quite important. Um, so I'm 62 years old. Um, that will be important in terms of, of disclosure, etc. about when I disclosed. Uh, when I was young, I played football. Football was my favourite sport. I loved football. Uh, from the age of 11, I was what's termed as scouted by Chelsea. So essentially, I played for Chelsea, was with Chelsea for about um, eight years of my life. Now, if you Google me, you won't find me, not with regard to my Chelsea stuff. Uh, you might find something about me with regards to what I'm doing now. So the point I'm trying to make in a long-winded way that I never made it as a professional footballer. I never became a superstar. I only played in the reserve team, the reserve team at Chelsea. So I wasn't uh, one of the big stars, hence you won't know my name. Although if I'd been playing for the reserves in Chelsea nowadays, I think I would have been quite rich. I think the, uh, that sort of part of football has changed. So I was at Chelsea for about, for about seven years uh, until I was 18 years old. Um, now, during that time with Chelsea, I was, I was abused by my coach. This was when I started uh, to be full-time at the club. Um, I was abused by my coach from, for about two years, from 15 to 17 years, years of age. It's very clear to me, looking back at this, that I was groomed by the coach, probably from the age of 11 years. And also that he groomed my parents. I found some, uh, a photograph not long ago of me playing at my old local club, where I lived in Harlow and Essex in England. Uh, a team called Pot Street Rangers, for what it's worth. It sounds very nice. Um, and there I was at the front of the crowd. Here was my abuser, Eddie Heath, my to-be abuser, Eddie Heath, uh, presenting me with a trophy, and my parents were in the background. Now, my, my parents thought my coach was a, was a great man. Um, uh, he was groomed by them. And my parents are both dead now. I think if, if my parents were still alive, I probably wouldn't be here talking about this. I think it would have been far too difficult for me to broach that subject with my parents and far too difficult for them to actually take this stuff. So th that's, uh, that's my background. I'm here because in... 2016, the end of 2016, November 6, whatever date it was in November, some footballers uh, in the UK, in England, disclosed that they'd been abused by their, by their coaches, particularly a guy called, called Andy Woodward. And at the time seemed right for this, people took notice, and it became, it started to get taken seriously. So round about this time, uh, having thought long and hard about this, I decided that I was going to disclose. Now, it wasn't an easy decision to disclose. I'm not saying I'll, I'll disclose just like that. It was quite a momentous decision. It's something I had to... It's something I talked through with my family and my children. I, I'm married. I have three children and um, three boys. Uh, we talked through this, and my family were very supportive. My wife supportive. My, 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 and my sons were supportive. And so I decided that I would go ahead and disclose and eventually waive my anonymity and talk about this in public. Now, this was done on a sort of uh, a proviso, if you like, that, um, that if I did disclose, I wouldn't just disclose and leave it at that. I decided that when I, when I disclosed, I would try to affect some change. I would try to work with relevant authorities, football clubs or whatever, in order to try to make sure what happened to me was less likely to happen in the future. So that's, that's what I've been doing since November uh, two, 2016. Uh, I just want to make a point about, about this, about how this... I, I'm going to talk about my wife for a moment. 
this was very, very difficult for my wife. She was in a position where she found herself having lived with a man for 30 years who had this very dark secret. It was very hard for her to, to cope with this. It was a, a diff very, very difficult decision to make. I suppose I'm, I'm, making, I'm making and saying that in order to give you some flavor of how difficult it is, it is to do this. Uh, so what I'm, what I'm going to do today then is talk to you about my last two and a half years, I suppose it is. Mm -hmm. What's it been like? Uh, what's happened? You've tried to affect change, Colin. Uh, what, you know, what kind of things have happened? And in order to do that, I'm going to talk about, I suppose, two main things. I'm going to talk, talk about how it was with my, with my old club, with Chelsea Football Club. In other words, this is going to be quite football-centric <coughs> and quite male-centric, but it's where I am, it's what I know. It's, it's the milieu in which I, I, I disclosed in. So I'll talk a bit about Chelsea and how they were and try to draw some conclusions about how football clubs and organisations react to discovering that, that abuse has happened either at their club or in their organisation or in their sports. And I think I can draw some lessons from that. And secondly, I want to talk about something very close to my heart, which is, which is the, the title that you got, which is the long-term effects of, of uh, sexual abuse and non-recent child sexual abuse in my case. And then to draw, draw out a bit more about how this relates to elite sport as well, because I think it has other implications, uh, or uh, more implica well, it just has different implications if we're talking about elite sport. So I'll be talking about some of the things that, that Sandra, uh, I'll be touching on the issues that Sandra's talked about, talked about this morning in her, when she was uh, covering the field in this issue. Um, okay, so I think, I think that's where I'm at. I suppose I'm trying to say, I'm going to be, try and be part, so in the last two and a half years, I've tried to be part of the solution to all this, uh, to make things better. So let me talk then a bit about my dealings with my football club, with, 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 Chelsea, with Chelsea Football Club, because I think they provide a good case study that helps us learn about how um, organisations react to, to disclosures. Finding out this kind of stuff is going on at their club. So let, let, me, let me start by telling you something about, about what happened at the club. Just post my disclosing to uh, disclosing and therefore disclosing to Chelsea Football Club, it came, very, it became, it came out in the press that before uh, Andy Woodward and other footballers had disclosed in November 2016, somebody had gone to Chelsea Football Club, a former player, it's not somebody I knew, he's slightly younger than me, uh, to say he was abused by his coach at Chelsea. This happened to be the coach that was, that was my abuser. This, guy's, this, this footballer's name was Gary Johnson. As I said, I, I never knew him. And what, what happened there was that Chelsea... Well, this is what Chelsea did. They decided that they would try to... Uh, well, they paid Gary Johnson £50,000 to decide uh, to, to sign a non-disclosure agreement. In other words, not to talk about this abuse, not to talk about this abuse. Uh, and this tells something about, tells us something about reactions to this kind of revelation. Uh, I suppose to tell part of the story, I, I read about this and I was absolutely incensed by this. And I, I remember phoning the safeguarding uh, officer at Chelsea, a guy called Mark Waters, and telling him this was, this was awful. That, that Chelsea had decided to pay somebody off when they'd revealed this, this important thing. Uh, they'd released this, this was in their press release, and at the bottom of the press release was the signature of the, uh, chair, the chairman and director of the club. And I said, I want to see these guys. I want to talk to them. And lo and behold, that happened very quickly. They sent a car to, to pick me up, and I found myself before, before the directors of the club. And I, I, I needed to tell them something about... Um, what I felt about this. So my initial point about organisations, clubs, whatever, when they hear about this, and Chelsea is a good example, was the, uh, was the notion of cover-up. That it seems to me an initial reaction is to try to cover up what happened. Now, I think this is important to try to unpack this. What does this actually mean, to cover up? 
it seemed to me in the case of Chelsea, and I've seen it in, in, other, in other cases as well of other organisations and clubs, is that they put their brand image, the brand, the image, before what I would call this much more important substantive issue of child sex abuse. So they have a, they have a sort of a, a business notion about this. Um, you know, the brand is more important than the issue. For me, that, that is taking the moral low ground. I, I, you know, it, it, it's morally wrong to do that. So that seems to be the first response to this, which is the idea of a cover-up. And secondly, something I've talked about is also this, this £50,000 paying somebody is a, is a transactional thing. It's another business way of dealing with what seems to me an important issue. So you deal with this with a transaction. £50, £50,000 will keep this out of the press. It might protect our image. So I think it's quite important that we learn that. That actually happened. It's not something I'm making up. This was a response uh, of the club. So, so the notion is, first point, we tend to see a cover-up. Clubs, organisations don't necessarily want to get this out or to let it out. Now, I credit where it's due. My club, since that point, they actually get this now. They understand it. And they, I think, are doing some good work when it comes to safeguarding and preventing this happening in the future. But that's another issue, and I can talk about that maybe at, at another time. My second point about institutions is the idea of uh, denial. There's a whole lot of denial going out there in football clubs and organisations. And let me tell you what I mean by denial. I think clubs and organisations tend to be reactive to these things. What I mean is, the stimulus to act upon the issue of sexual abuse in a club or an organisation is usually brought about by the revelation that the act of abuse has taken place in the club or the organisation. That stimulates them to action. So they're reactive to this. And so the corollary of that really is that if we don't know about it, it's not taking place here. That seems to be a reaction. We certainly get this in football clubs and organisations. It's not happening. You know, it's not happening here. You know, we don't know anything about it. Nobody's re revealed it. Therefore, it isn't happening here. And I think... Uh, I would say that's a pretty dangerous assumption to make because we know that probably, that's probably not true. And I, I get the point you can make, especially in football clubs, and I told you this would be football-centric, but non-recent uh, child sexual abuse disclosures <coughs> are non-recent, aren't they? I'm standing up here, I'm an old guy, I'm 62. This happened 45 years ago, right, 45 years ago. So I can understand why clubs might say, well, yeah, but come on, that was 45 years ago. It's not happening now, we haven't heard anything. So I get that, but we know that's wrong because we know it's wrong because we, we see what's going on in the world out there. You know, we just have to look at uh, gymnastics, for example. That's now, that's here, that's now, it's happening, you know. Um, so this stuff happens, and the idea that it is all, all happened in the past, we actually know it's wrong. Um, so what we can glean from that is that this is not necessarily a specific sport issue, uh, I don't think. I mean, it's not necessarily a sport issue. Sandra's spoken about that. What it seems to be, and particularly in sport, is about power and about power dynamics. And I think the important thing for us to learn is that when we're talking about, yes, it may make football, it's to do with the power. Being a coach, how sport is set up, particularly how elite sport is set up, is that some people have more power than others. Coaches have a huge amount of power. So I'm not making the ridiculous assumption that all coaches are abusers. Of course they're not. All I'm saying is that the dynamic set up in elite sport particularly, and in sport generally, means that there is a, there's an imbalance of power, and that's something, that's something which means we have, to, we have to take that seriously, because that is why abuse happens. It's about the imbalance of power. And Sandra has spoken about, spoken about this earlier. So I think this denial is not very progressive. I think we, there has, we have to stop the denial. And, and I think progress happens in clubs and organisations in sport where they act as if abuse is happening and adjust their safeguarding, their rules and regulations accordingly, assuming that it is. 
because I think that's much more in touch with reality and much more in touch with progressive, but I, uh, much more progressive. But I understand why clubs don't do it. All these things and organisations don't do it. They have a financial implication. And a lot of elite sport is either trying to make my football club, uh, yeah, uh, are trying to make a profit, and they do it very by old football club, uh, and organisations are, are cash stretched. Ask any safeguarding officer in the UK, what's your budget like? They're not going to say, ah, fantastic, we've got loads of money. No, they're not. They haven't. It's under-resourced, so we need to be mindful of that. So I can see why there's a business case for denial. It isn't happening. We, don't, we can continue to say that's the case. We won't have to put resources into it. But it's wrong. <coughs> but it's wrong. But I can see how that might act as a, an incentive. The third thing that I've learned dealing with organisations as clubs is really very simple, really simple. If you want to get change done, you have to, you have to hit the people that have got the power. If you can start affecting people that have power, whether it's the IOC, whether it's a football association, whether it's a football club, if the people in power, the people with their who have the, and with the purse strings, start to take this seriously, if you can affect them, then you start to get things done. And two examples of that for me are my old club. I now know that the chairman has seen a lot about the effects of abuse, the effects that abuse has long-term on some of the ex-players. That's moved him. He's now doing stuff. Trust me, he's increased the safeguarding budget at Chelsea beyond, <coughs> beyond anything that uh, might the old safeguarding officer could have imagined. It's affecting the person at the top. I think I started to have some effect at the Football Association, in, 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 uh, in the English Football Association, when I made a point of getting in touch with the chairman of the club. Things started to happen. So getting to the people in power is very important. So that's the third thing I've, I've learned from all this. Um, so just a few takeaway points on that when I move on to the long-term long effects. Firstly, then, I'll read my points out. I don't like reading stuff out. But firstly, clubs must be prepared to countenance that they've made mistakes in the past. They have to be prepared to admit that. And quite often to say, OK, fine, we've made, you know, we've made a mistake. When we admit that, we did it wrong. That seems to be difficult sometimes. Clubs mustn't bury their head in the sand uh, because there have been no reported cases. I made my point there. Uh, clubs need to be proactive. They need to make sure their safeguarding is exemplary. And I think something I've added to my list, they need to be prepared to listen to victims of sexual abuse that are, be, that are prepared to become ambassadors and go out into the public and talk about what happened to them. Now, I'm here today uh, thanks really to the Vice Project, and I know Mike, and this is Mike's brainchild, is going to talk to you about this earlier. But when I first decided to, dis to disclose, um, I set out with high hopes, as you might do. Lots of reservations. I was quite scared in doing so, quite scared. But I spoke to people in various organisations and they talked a lot about how things were going to change and how they were going to do things and how they are going to help this. And after six months, I felt so despondent that I just thought to myself, I'm going to give up because there's lots of talk and nothing's happening. And it was that point, for chance, that I heard about Mike and the Voices Project and I got involved in the Voice Project and it was this project that gave me, at a time when I thought, enough, I mean, you've made a mistake, this was just the wrong thing to do. It gave me the impetus to carry on, because it did put people's uh, survivors' voices at the forefront. We were heard, and Mike will talk to you about this in, in, a, in a lot more detail later. So that's my experiences of dealing with the clubs. Um, and I think they're a lot better now. They've got a bit there. Yeah, some of them are a lot, lot better. Back to the title of my, of my talk, which was uh, Long Term Effects of Sexual Abuse. And I need to talk very personally about my experience um, of this uh, to make some sense of it, I think. And I spoke about this at a conference I was at last week, <coughs> the things I'm going to say now. And 
uh, if, you, if you're worried that somehow I'm betraying my wife, saying, talking about these confidences, don't worry, she knows, she knows what I'm going to say and she knows I'm going to talk about what happened in our relationship. That will become clear in a minute. That sounds very interesting, all secretive, but I'm going to, don't worry, it's going, to, it's going to come out. You'll see what I mean. Uh, so let me talk about what I, to me, what I'm seeing as a long-term effect of, of, uh, of child sexual abuse. Um, the legacy, if, if you like. And again, Sandra touched on this, and I think it's very important that she did. So when I first told Tracy, my wife, about, about the sec sexual abuse, um, a difficult time for her and a difficult time for me, she said to me these words, that explains a lot, doesn't it? That explains a lot, doesn't it? Let me try to give you some notion of, of what she meant by that. Um, she was talking about me, Colin the person. So for all my adult life, as I can, I can remember it, uh, I've suffered from mental health problems. When I left Chelsea around about 18, I tried to commit suicide. I had a good attempt at it. I didn't. I took an overdose. I, I didn't succeed, as you can see. Um, I've suffered from depression, from mild to severe depression all my life. Uh, low self-esteem, always feeling guilt. I've got a whole list of maladies down here. I can keep going. Um, lots of anger, anger in at myself, and lots of shame at myself on what I do. I've carried this around with me for 40, 45, however many years. Um, so I'm, I'm a depressive. I've suffered from depression. What my wife was getting at when she said that, that explains a lot. Her diagnosis, if you like, was that you got abused as a kid, sexually abused as a kid, and that's caused you to be as you have been in your adult life. That was her diagnosis. That was what she was trying to tell me. I resisted this. I resisted this, and I, um, I resisted it for a while, because my take on this was, no, 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 not true. I, I'm just constitutionally, by nature, somebody that is a depressive. That's me. That's Colin. That's what you've got. That's you. Now, as you can imagine, doing what I do here, I'm doing here, and, and Karen's here, and lots of people that, uh, that share our experiences. I've met a lot of people that have been uh, sexually abused as children, and particularly in sport. And it's been a revelation to me, from my very, I would say, probably ignorant, arrogant position to start with, that this is constitutional rather than... Um, uh, the nurture. When we spoke to each other as individuals, it became very clear to me that we were talking about really similar things. I remember the first time I spoke to Karen, and we spoke about our lives, and I thought, my God, Karen could have been talking about my life. <coughs> the mental health issues, suicide, problems with relationships, low self-esteem, whatever. And other people that I talked to as I got more involved in this, are almost repeating each other's life patterns. It was quite extraordinary. At this point, I, I, I realised that there was actually, there seemed to be this connection, relationship between early sexual abuse and, and long-term life chances, mental health uh, issues, and, and so on and so forth. So I'm not saying one, you know, early sexual abuse causes um, long-term health issues, but I'm saying there's certainly a connection. It's something I'm very, very interested in, uh, to hear more people's stories, to try to get some, you know, some more um, evidence-based research on this. I think it's important to do so. And I just, I suppose, want to finish by, by, by relating this now to elite sport. And again, Sandra touched on this today. Um, I think elite sport brings extra dimensions into the mix when we're talking about uh, long-term effects here. Let me, let me just go through them. So I'm making the point that, that I think long-term uh, early sexual abuse you know, really does cast a dark shadow over people's lives. And I think we need to try and unpack this more with elite sport. First of all, there's this issue of, of elite sport and failure. Uh, these are the 2%, 98% figures. Most people fail when it comes to elite sports. You know, the 2% make it. A lot of people, a lot of, lot of people don't make it in, when they 
when they finish this, this dream that they had to be a top footballer, a top athlete, whatever, most people don't make it. Only very few do. I, in the course of my interest in this, I think I've spoken to about half a dozen therapists now who, who, who treat people like me, uh, who have been in sport uh, and have suffered abuse and are now out of sport. And one of the things they talk about to a, to a person is this issue of transition. The transition from elite sport out of elite sport. And if you factor in early sexual abuse and that as well. They say it's absolutely toxic. It's something that we, we, don't, we don't do very well. We don't transition potential elite sport people out of the sport very well. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real issue. And, and as we were hearing earlier, we're not very good at helping athletes do transition. We're not very good at doing it. We have to admit that, and I think we have to do more in terms of long-term welfare of, of um, athletes, particularly elite athletes. One more thing. How am I doing for time? Are we? Oh, perfect. Perfect, all right. I've got five minutes. I think the other thing, and this is very male-centered and very football-centered because it's, it's my experience, when, when we've looked at, when we have these recent football disclosures in, in England, in, in the UK, um, I've heard the terms masculinity mentioned, and these, these, are, these have been mentioned by, by men that I know that disclosed at that time, and that, that I've spent time with. And what seems to be quite, well, it's sort of loud and clear, I would say, to, you, to use that, that overused term, that one of the reasons for men not disclosing, look, bear in mind, I disclosed, you know, 46, a long time after the abuse. It's one hell of a long time. I'm not exactly an outlier, but I'm at the back end of uh, that. But a lot of the men that disclose uh, in football, the reason for not disclosing up to that point was this consideration about how it would reflect upon them as a man. You know, something about being a man and disclosing this stuff that happened to you all those years ago when you were young, and an instance about, but, you know, homosexuality and so on and so forth. So it's somehow that disclosure of this abuse, of this abuse said something about their manliness, about heterosexual norms <coughs> that seem to be holding them back. And it... it, it it struck me that when Andy Woodward disclosed in, in 2016 in, in the UK, he seemed, to, he seemed to give other men permission to say, we can now talk about this. Because this was all over the press in the UK and men were talking about it. So there's something about at the disclosure, the public disclosure, and it being very big in England, that, that allowed men to somehow overcome that barrier, that barrier of masculinity. And I think that's quite important for us to understand, that masculinity, the revealing that you, through your socialization, through your culture, that tells you what's masculine, you are somehow transgressing that, is a very, is a very big barrier. And we need to understand that one, because I think it's very important. And this is the thing, the permission from my wife to say this, and uh, I've said it a couple of times, so it doesn't move me as it might have done saying it. And I said this at the conference last week, and Tracy knows I'm going to say this. I can't reveal the full extent of my sexual abuse to my wife now. I've told her that, and I've told her why. And the reason why is that I think she'll think less of me as a bloke. And that's the honest truth. And I'm saying that because it's real. And I think I'm fairly easygoing. I think I'm a liberal kind of bloke. I think I can talk about anything. But that masculine socialization for me appears to be so, so strong that I still can't do that. And we've come to an agreement with that. It's fine. We're, we're OK with that. But for me, that really says one hell of a lot about the strength of masculinity as a barrier to disclosing and moving forward on all this. So, let me sum up, because I've got five minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two, one minute, one and a half minutes. Now you've got one, Colin, because you're not getting on. Okay. Um, 
So simple points. Look, the abuse doesn't. I don't think the abuse, uh, the issues stop when the abuse stops. I think, I think, you know, there's so much anecdotal evidence now, but the issues don't stop when the abuse stops. The long-term effects of, of, of child sexual abuse on on health are are problematic, and I think sports governors and elite clubs, whoever, should develop policy that looks after player welfare in this. And I know we were talking about that again that we talked about earlier today. The other thing that we touched upon and I haven't really touched upon um, is this idea of making it easier for children to speak out at the time. We talked about bystanders. Um, I always say this at conferences and I think because I think, it, it, well it's true but it, it's powerful. I know this is going to haunt me till the day I die. Why didn't I say something? Why did I not say something when I was a 14, 15, 16 year old? Why? Why was it? Why did I just, why did this stuff just happen? I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Everything seemed to be holding me. Couldn't tell my parents. And also the bystander thing. Recently, my, my other coach, a guy called Ken Shellito at Chelsea, who was the other side of all this, he was like a father figure to me. I had a very strong, um, slightly emotionally abusive father. Ken was a soft man, he was a coach at Chelsea. Uh, he recently died. The reason I'm saying this, well, that made me sad. Why didn't Ken say something? He knew this was going on. Why didn't he say something? That bystander thing. What was it holding people like him in place? Because I always saw him as, a, as a, a decent bloke. I loved him dearly. He was, he was, you know, he meant so much to me. He didn't say anything. Why? So the bystander effect is very, is, is very real. Um, so we need to, some, we, we, can't, we don't know how to do this. We don't know how to create the conditions and the culture to allow children to speak about these things. I don't think we do anyway. Somebody tell me different, please tell me different, but I don't think we know how to do that well. And we need to, we need to, we need to understand how to do that. And we need to find, which, is, which is, goes along with this, a way to shift power down from the coach to the parents, to the children, a cultural conditions that allow that to happen. And that's so easy to say and so difficult to do uh, because you've got parents who want their kids to succeed, you've got coaches who like their power, who's going to relinquish power, how are we going to change that culture? So those, are, those I suppose, are the take-home messages. We need to normalise athletes' voice, to use an over -word, overused word now, normalise. Normalise athletes' voice in all this. Um, it may sound like I'm telling you a very a depressed, you know, down story, but I think in the, in the two and a half years I've been involved in this, I think we've seen a lot of progress. So I want to be a bit more upbeat about this. I think we've seen a lot of progress. I'm here, we're here, this is being talked about in a way that I could never have imagined at the end of 2016. So it's a positive story, folks, in some ways, but we need to go back and understand the abuse, how it happened, the effects of it, in order to push forward. I think that's the important. Okay, I'm done.